These are the solutions to the Junior Cycle Higher Level 2022 maths paper. Question 1A. Jane buys a laptop online for $699 plus a shipping cost of $30. The exchange rate is $1 is equal to uh, 90 cent. Work out in euro the total cost to Jane of buying the laptop online. First thing we have to do here is just be careful that we have to add on the shipping cost onto the online price first of all. So let's do that first. So we have $699 plus my $30 shipping, which is giving me a total in dollars of 729 euro for the laptop. Now we're going to look at our exchange rate. So exchange rate is $1, which is equal to 0 euro and 90 cent. So that's what we're given in the top of the question. Um, I'm trying to go from $1 to $729. So to go from 1 to 729, I basically just have to multiply both sides by 729. So in this question, I just have to simply multiply 0 0.9 multiplied by 729, which gives me 656 euro and 10 cents. So that's the cost of the laptop in euro. Looking at part B, Jane has a gross annual income of 56,000 euro. Jane pays income tax on her gross income at a rate of 20% on the first 44,300 and 40% on the balance. Work out Jane's annual income tax at each of these two rates, the 20% and the 40% rate. Okay, so first thing I'm going to do here is kind of look at it on a, uh, a number line basis. So I have my zero euro first of all, and on the first... 44,300 euro, it's going to be at 20%. So this part here is at 20%. The remainder then is going to be at 40%, but that remainder is going to be the full amount of the wages, 56,000, subtract the 44,300. So that's my first step. So I'm going to go 56,000, subtract 44,300 euro. And that's giving me 11,700 euro. So this part portion in here at the 40% is going to be at 11,700 euro. So I just need to work both of those out. So my first one is going to be 44,300 euro at 20%. So I'm dividing by 100 and multiplying by 20, which will give me 8,860. And my second one will be my 11,700 euro at the higher rate, which is 40%. So I'm dividing 11,700 by 100, then multiplying by 40, which is giving 4,680 euro. So again, just make sure you put them in both of your uh, spaces that they want your answers. So I'm writing 8860 and 4680. Looking at B part two now, it's telling us that Jane has annual tax credits of 3,300 euro work out Jane's annual take home pay. So first thing I want to look at here is finding out Jane's total tax. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go back up to B part one and add our income tax. So her income tax was the lower rate, 8,860. And I'm going to add on the 4,680 now to that figure, which is giving me 13,540 euros. So that's her total, let's call it total, income tax, IT, income tax. Next thing I want to do now is look at Jane's tax credit. So tax credit is good to Jane. Jane gets that 3,300 euro off her tax. So I'm taking her tax now, her 13,540. I'm gonna subtract the tax credit because the credit is good to Jane. And that's giving me 10,000 240 euro so that 10,240 euro basically represents her net tax this figure over here her total income tax we could have called her gross tax if we wanted to and now in order to find out uh, Jane's annual take-home pay I'm going to take her wages 56,000 euro her total income I'm going to subtract her net tax the 10,240 euro from it and that's giving me a total take home pay for Jane of 45,760 euro. Looking at question two now, 
When Maeve's team play a match, they can either win, draw or lose. Part A. Fill in the table below to show the nine possible outcomes when Maeve's team plays two matches. One is already done. So WD is telling us that Maeve has won one match and drew the other. So filling in the table, uh, we'll fill in W. So how it works basically is let's start with this one. So if I was to draw and then I come over here, if I want to fill in this, I have to then bring it up to the L. So what will go in there would be DL because it, it's crossing over with the D and the L. So in here, I'd fit in DL. So the first one obviously would be this one, which would be a win and followed by a win. So I'd be putting a W, W in my first box here. And following on that, it would be WL. I would have a draw and a win here. I could draw and I could draw. I could lose and win, lose and draw, lose and lose. So that's our table complete. Part B then, Maeve thinks that each outcome in the table is equally likely. Based on this, find the probability that when Maeve's team plays two matches, they win at least one match. Give your answer as a fraction. So we're looking for winning at least one. Uh, well, here they've won two, so I can accept that. They've won another one, they've won another one, they've won another one, they've won another one. In the other four games, they've lost and drawn. So in total there, I have highlighted five um, matches. So that's going to be five out of a total of nine. And the question wants it as a fraction, so five ninths. And part C. Maeve's team plays five matches in a competition. Work out the total number of different possible outcomes for Maeve's team for these five matches. For example, one solution would be WWLDW. So win, win, lose, draw, win. Uh, so let's look at it like this. Different ways we can do it. But I'm going to start off with match one and match two and match three and match four and match five. Now, and in probability means to multiply. So that's the first thing I'm going to do. So I've, I'm just going to put a multiply in instead of all these ands. So you can see here, there's five uh, scenarios. There's a figure here I have to fill in for match one, match two, match three, match four, match five. If you think about it, the first match, how many different ways can Maeve, uh, or how many different ways can that match uh, finish? It can finish as a draw, a win or a lose. So there's three ways for match one to finish. And that's the same for match two. Match two could be a win, lose, or draw. Match three, a win, lose, or draw. Match four, win, lose, or draw. Match five, win, lose, or draw. So all I have to do basically is just multiply three by three by three by three by three. So it's really using our fundamental principle of counting, if you remember back to that in your revision. So fundamental principle of counting, but no need to mention that. And that's the same as three to the power of five, if you want. And if I multiply out um, three to the power of five, I get 243. So there's 243 uh, different possible outcomes. Looking now at part D, Maeve's team plays 11 matches in a league. The table below shows the number of goals that Maeve's team scores in each of these 11 matches. Work out the mean number of goals that Maeve's team scores per match. Give your answer to one decimal place. So to calculate the mean, it's our average. We have to add them all up and divide by how many matches we have. So basically all I'm doing here in this question is taking the figures from the table. So three plus one plus one plus zero plus two plus seven plus one plus zero plus two plus one plus three, dividing it by the total number of numbers or total number of matches, which is 11. So I'm getting 21 over 11. Question wants it in decimal, so that's 1.909, but the question wants it to one decimal place. So therefore my answer would be 1.9. So the mean here is 1.9. Part E, complete the pie chart uh, below to summarize the data above, showing the proportion of their games in each of Maeve's team scored zero goals, one goal and so on. Label each sector and the size of the angle. Okay, so let's have a look at this. So let's look at the scenario of zero goals. So let's start with that, zero goals. What happens, how many times did that happen? Well, if I go back up to my table, uh, I have a zero appearing twice and it's out of 11 games. So two out of 11 had zero goals. And to turn that into an angle for my pie chart, it's out of 360 degrees. So that's giving me roughly 65.45 degrees. 
Then I'm going to go to how many times one goal appeared. And if I go back up to my table, I have four ones. So that's four out of 11. And I'm timesing that by 360, which is giving me approximately 130.90 degrees. I'm then going to two goals. How many times did we have two goals? We had it twice. And that is going to be two out of 11 multiplied by 360 degrees, which is giving me 65.45. That's the same as zero goals that we've already done. If we look now at three goals, what's happening here? How many times did I have three goals? I had it twice again, two of them, two out of 11 times 360, which again is 65.45 degrees. And finally, had we anything with four goals? We didn't, five, six, we had one seven goal. So I have a seven goals and I had only one match that that happened. So that's one out of 11 times 360, which is 32.72 degrees. Now don't be too worried here if all your degrees don't add up exactly to 360 degrees. Mine are adding up to 359.97. It's just my rounding. I could really make them up to 0.5s and 0.8s, but I'm going to stick with what I have because I'm, I'm basically just sketching this onto our um, pie chart. Let's have a look at our pie chart now. So when you're starting with your pie chart, just first of all, connect the center to the edge of the circle. That's your starting line. So that's my first. Now on that, I'm going to do my zero goals, which is my 65.45 degrees, which should look like that. And the question again wants us to label each sector and its size. So something like that, zero goals and the size of it, 65.45. And you just continue that with protractor the whole way around the circle. And when you're finished, it should look something like that. Question three, the coordinate diagram below shows part of the N22 road in County Cork. Two points in the road P and Q are marked in the diagram. Part A, the point Q has the coordinates of six, two. Write down the coordinates of P. Well, P is located here. And the coordinates of that point are back minus one on the X axis, so minus one up three, so minus one, three. The equation of the line PQ is given as that. Use this or otherwise to find the coordinates of the point where the line PQ crosses the Y axis. So where does PQ cross the Y axis? Well, I'm just going to come back up to my drawing here and look at the line PQ. This is the line that they're getting us to focus in on here. So where does that blue line cross the X axis? Or sorry, the Y axis and the Y axis that so are looking for this coordinate here. They're getting us to find that coordinate. Where does the line cut the Y axis? Now it's, you can kind of see that it's slightly below three. So that's what we have to look out for. Now, when you're looking at this, where it crosses or cuts the Y axis, we know that the, what, the X part has to be zero. So we're gonna let X equals to zero here because we know that that coordinate has to be zero something. It looks like it's gonna be zero 2.8 or something like that. So there's the first part. I know my X has to be zero because that's always going to be zero when it crosses the Y axis. And in order to get the Y part, I just need to let X equal to zero in my equation of the line, X plus seven Y equals 20. So here I just need to basically sub in zero for X and then go plus seven y equals 20, a little bit of algebra here. I can drop the zero now, so seven y is equal to 20. And then to get y on its own, I need to divide across by seven. So y is equal to 20 over seven, which is roughly um, 2.86. So 2.86, you can leave it as fraction if you want, but I'm just gonna put it in as decimal, 2.86. That looks about right. If you look back at our picture, it's zero up to, as we said, slightly below three. Uh, looking now at part C to that question. A new road is built through the point Q, 6, 2. On the coordinate diagram, it will be a straight line segment which is perpendicular to PQ. Just remember what perpendicular means. It means that it's going to create a 90 degree angle at those lines. So these two lines are perpendicular because they create 90 degree angles. Work out the equation of the new road. Give your answer in the form AX plus BY plus C equals zero. 
Okay, so let's come back to our picture. What's it basically telling us to do? It's trying to get us to draw a line now, which is perpendicular to PQ, and it goes through Q. So our new road, or our new line, will look something like that. So it has to create a 90 degree here with uh, my original line PQ. So if we come back to our section here, what do we need in order to uh, create or form the equation of a line? The equation of the line is taken from our log tables and it's given as y minus y1 equals m bracket x minus x1. And in order to fill this in, we need a slope and we need a point. Now the point is quite easy to figure out here because it tells us that it goes through Q. So the point that I have to use must be 6, 2. So that's going to be my X1 and my Y1. But the next thing I need to do though is come up and find this M, M standing for slope. Um, so my slope I can use from part B. Remember we have the equation of the line PQ. So the equation of the line PQ was x plus 7y equals 20. Now I want to use that equation of the line to find its slope. So to get the slope, we want to write it in the form y is equal to mx plus c. So I need to go 7y is equal to move over that x, it becomes a minus 1x plus 20. Then to get y in its own, I divide across by 7. So something like that. So the slope of PQ, so I'll just write it, um, stuck for space in this question actually. So slope of PQ is equal to minus one over seven. Now that's that line. The slope of the line perpendicular to it, if you remember how to find perpendicular slopes, so I'm just gonna use my symbol for perpendicular, PQ is equal to flip the fraction. So it becomes seven over one and I change the sign to a plus. So it's now plus seven over one, which is basically the same as just seven because one divides into seven, seven times. So the perpendicular slope to minus one over seven is positive seven. So that's my slope for my new equation of the line. So I'm now coming back finally to filling in my equation of the line, y minus y1 is equal to m times x minus x1. And filling it in, y minus my y1, my y1 from over here was two, equals m, which I just found to be seven, bracket x minus x1, x1 was six. Now I just need to multiply in that bracket. So seven by x will give me seven x, seven by minus six will give me minus 42. So I have y minus two is equal to seven x minus 42. Now we come back to the question and look at the way they want it. They want it to be ax, so the x first, then the b, then the number equals zero. So I'm basically just gonna move everything over to one side. So I have zero is equal to seven X minus 42 minus Y plus two is equal to zero. And tidying that up, I have zero is equal to seven X um, minus Y and minus 42 plus 22 is minus 40. Or you could have it do it away. Seven X minus Y minus 40 is equal to zero. Or alternatively, if you've been doing this yourself, another acceptable answer would be minus seven X plus Y plus 40 is equal to zero, if you have the opposite signs. So just to kind of recap there, this answer, this answer, this answer are all uh, fine. Okay, looking at part D, the distance PQ on the diagram is 7.1 centimeters. Uh, correct to one decimal place. Five millimeters on the diagram represents 100 meters. So what they mean there is that five millimeters on the map represents 100 meters in reality. Use this to work out the actual distance from P to Q. So just be careful here, they're using centimeters, millimeters, and meters. So we just need to be careful uh, converting with them here. So I'm just gonna kind of recap some pieces of information here. One centimeter we know is equal to 10 millimeters. So in the question here, they've given us a distance of 7.1 centimeters. So turning 7.1 centimeters into millimeters, I multiply it by 10. So it's the same as 71 millimeters. Now they tell us that the distance on the map of five millimeters represents 100 meters. So I basically just need to take the total distance on my map, 71 millimeters, divide that by five millimeters, 
and that's giving me 14.2. So that 14.2 is telling us the amount of units on the map. Now, each of those five millimeters or each of those units is 100 meters in reality. So I now need to multiply my 14.2 by 100 meters to get the actual length of it. And that's giving me 1,420 meters. Now the question said give it in kilometers. So to turn meters into kilometers, we need to divide by 1,000. So that's giving me a total distance of 1.42 kilometers in reality. Question four, three triangles, A, B, and C are shown. The given lengths of the sides of each triangle are in centimeters where X and Y are elements of N. So N standing for just natural numbers. So they have to be whole numbers in other words. In this question, take the perimeter to mean the length of the perimeter. So the total length. Part A, the perimeter of triangle A is eight centimeters. Two of the sides are two centimeters and 3.5 centimeters respectively as shown. Work out the length of the third side. Well, we know that the three sides add up to eight. So all I'm doing here is taking the full length of the triangle, subtract the other two lengths. So two plus three and a half. So I'm basically just doing eight subtract uh, five and a half, which is giving me a total length of my third side of 2.5 centimeters. Don't forget your units there, 2.5. B part one, write down the perimeter of triangle B in terms of X. So how do we get the perimeter of triangle B? We add up the three sides. So I'm going three plus the other side, which is two X plus the third side, which is two X plus one. I'm then going to group like terms. So I'm going to put the three and the one together, which gives me four. And then I'm going to put the positive two X and the positive two X together to give me a positive 4x. So the perimeter of the triangle B is 4 plus 4x or 4x plus 4. So I'm going to just write that down. It's the same as 4x plus 4. It doesn't matter which way you write it. B part 2. The perimeter of triangle B is 24 centimeters. Work out the value of x. So all I have to do here is take my answer from part B part 1, 4x plus 4. They're telling us the perimeter is 24, so that means it's equal to 24. And now I just need to solve that equation. So I'm gonna bring over this four or subtract four from both sides. So that gives me four X is equal to 24 minus four. So that's four X is equal to 20. Divide both sides by four, which will give me 20 divided by four, which gives me a value of five centimeters for X. Looking now at C, the perimeters of the three triangles A, B, and C form a linear sequence. Triangle C has the largest perimeter. The perimeter of triangle C is K. Find the value of K. Linear sequence just basically means it goes up by the same amount each time. So I add on a number each time to give me the next one. So I have three triangles here. I have um, A, B, and C. The perimeter of A is eight. The perimeter of B is 24. These are all from part A and B of this question. And they tell me now that the perimeter of C is K. And that's what I need to find. But if I look now at the difference between these two terms, the difference between these two terms is 16, 24 take away eight. But it tells us then that it's linear. So it's the same difference each time. So the difference between B and C is also 16. So in order to get the value of K, so therefore, K is going to be um, the 24 plus the 16, which would be 40. So the value of K in this question is 40. And think about it, if I put a 40 in here, I would have 24 plus 16 gives me my 40. And that's the value of K. And part two, hence work out the value of Y. So I need to come back now to my triangles and remember uh, Y is relating to um, triangle C. So the perimeter of triangle C would be adding the three sides together like that. And I'm told that the perimeter is 40 from C part one. So I'm letting it equal to 40. Tidying that up, putting the Y squared together, it gives me two Y squared. Three and five is eight is equal to 40. I'm going to move that eight over or subtract eight from both sides. In other words, so that's 40 subtract eight. So two Y squared is equal to 32. 
I then want to get the y squared on its own, so I'm going to divide across by the 2, the 2 that's stuck here to the y squared. And that's giving me uh, y squared is equal to 32 divided by 2, which is 16. Now to get y on its own, to get rid of a square, we find its square root. So my answer here is the square root of 16, which is 4 centimeters. So y is equal to 4 centimeters. Question 5. A balloon pump is made from a cylinder with an internal diameter of 6 centimeters and a height of 20 centimeters, as shown. Each time the pump is pumped, it passes one full cylinder of air into a balloon. Show that the volume of one full cylinder of air is 180 uh, pi. So the volume of a cylinder formula from our log tables is given as pi r squared h. And we know with our cylinder, um, it has a radius of uh, 3 centimeters because the diameter is 6 and the radius is half of that, which is 3. So just remember to half your diameter. And my height of my cylinder is 20 centimeters. And they want it in terms of pi, so I'm not changing the pi to 3.14. So that's giving me a volume of my cylinder of pi multiplied by 9 multiplied by 20, which is giving me a volume of 180 pi centimeters cubed. That's the volume of my cylinder. Part B, Dara is inflating a balloon in the shape of a cylinder. When fully inflated, the balloon has a radius of 15 centimetres. Find the volume of Dara's balloon when it's fully inflated. Give your answer in centimetres cubed in terms of pi. Once again, from your log tables, the volume of a sphere is given as 4 thirds pi or cubed. And filling in all the information, I have a volume of 4 over 3 multiplied by my radius. Well, my radius is 15 cubed, which is giving me a volume of 4,500 pi centimeters cubed. That's the volume of the balloon. In part two to that question, it says that Dara pumps the pump every second. How many seconds will it take Dara to fully inflate the balloon? Well, if we go back and look at this, the a uh, balloon has a volume of 4,500 pi centimeters cubed. That's the volume of the um, balloon. The pump has a volume of 180 pi. And I basically just need to find out how many of the pumps are in the balloon. So I'm dividing the volume of the balloon by the volume of the pump. And dividing that in, I get 25. And it says it's in seconds, so 25 seconds. Uh, not too bad for that part of the question. And finally, part C. Gustav is inflating a bigger balloon in the shape of a sphere. He also pumps the pump once every second. His balloon is fully inflated after 50 seconds. Uh, find the radius of his balloon to one decimal place. Okay, well, we do know the volume of uh, Gustav's large balloon. So the volume of, I'll call it just large balloon. The volume of it is 50 times um, 180 pi. Because the volume of the cylinder every second is 180 pi, and it takes 50 seconds to fill it. So 180 pi multiplied by 50 gives you a volume of 9,000 pi centimeters cubed. So that's the volume of this large um a balloon now we don't know the radius of it i think that's what we're trying to find out it is so we're trying to find out the radius of this balloon but the formula once again is going to be volume is equal to four thirds pi or cubed now we know the volume of it it's nine thousand pi so we're letting the volume of the sphere four thirds pi or cubed equal to nine thousand pi now, I'm going to cancel the pi from both sides because I'm dividing across by pi. It's common to both. So I'm left with the volume 4 over 3 radius cubed is equal to 9,000. To get radius cubed on its own, I divide across by 4 over 3. So 9,000 divided by 4 over 3. 
dividing 9,000 by 4 over 3 on my calculator gives me 6750. Oh, that's equal to my radius cubed. Now, I'm using the cubed root button on my calculator, the one with the little 3 over it, which is the cubed root of 6750. Oh, that'll get me the radius, and that's giving me R as 18.8988. The question wants it to one decimal place, so the radius is going to be 18.9 centimeters. Question six is a sets question. 80 students in a group were asked what, have, what had they done during their summer holidays. Some of the students got a job, some went on holidays, some did both, some did neither. One fifth of the students in the group did neither. 25% got a job. Of those students who got a job, half also went on holidays. Work out the total number of students in the group who went on holidays. Okay, so we kind of just need to fill in everything we know first of all. So we know that there's 80 students, so I'm going to put that as my universal. So I have 80 students in total inside the box. We know one fifth of the group of the students in the group did neither. So I basically just now need to find uh, one fifth. I'll do my rough work out here. One fifth of 80 students. So divide by five multiplied by one. So one fifth of 80 is going to give me um 16 isn't it so 16 students did neither so i'm going to put 16 out here outside my two circles 25 percent of all the group uh got a job so 25 percent of 80 divided by 100 multiplied by 25 is 20 students so 20 students got a job um what else do we know? It tells us that of these students who got a job, half went on holidays. So there's 20 students got a job, half went on holidays. So I need to divide the 20 by two, so half of it, which is 10 students. So these 10 went on holidays, this circle here. But don't forget that this full circle here accounts for 20 students. So that means that the, the amount of students who just got a job is 10. So 10 just got a job and also 10 got a job and went on holidays. So now let's figure out our holidays now. In total, we have 80 students. I'm going to subtract the 10 who got a job, the 10 who went on holidays and the 16 who didn't do either. So if I take 80, subtract 36 gives me 44. So that's telling me that 44 goes in here, just went on holidays. Now the question wants us to figure out the total number of students in the group who went on holidays, but don't forget that there's also these 10 that went on a holiday. So in total, my final answer here would be 54. 54 students went on holidays. Okay, question seven, A. Amy and Joe are asked to pick values for numbers P, Q, and R so that the following is always true. A to the power of P multiplied by A to the power of Q multiplied by A to the power of R is equal to A to the power of 12. Part one, Amy picks three values that are all the same. So P is the same as Q, which is equal to R. Write down the values of P, Q, and R that Amy picks. Now for this question here, we really need to use our log tables on page 21. And the very first rule up the top left hand corner of page 21 is given as a to the power of p times a to the power of q is equal to a to the power of p plus q. So that's the rule I'm using here. I need to find out uh, three powers that I add together give me 12. So what I could use here is I could use a to the power of 4 times a to the power of 4 times a to the power of 4 and that top rule on page 21 would tell me that it's a to the power of 4 plus 4 plus 4 i add the powers and they have to be all the same so my values for p q and r are have to be 4 because 4 plus 4 plus 4 is 12 and 4 is the only value that i can add to make 12. Uh, part two joe picked three values that were all different write down possible values for p q and r okay so again you're using log tables here on page 21 using the rule a to the p uh, times a to the q and that is a to the p plus q 
So you're just looking for three values that add to 12. So I could use a to the two times a to the four times a to the six, because that's the same as a to the two plus four plus six, which is a to the 12. So I could use two, uh, four and six. Look, many different values you could use there. Um, as long as the three values you pick add up to 12. And finally, B, find the value of M so that the following is true. Okay, uh, again, make sure we're on page 21 of our logs here. We need to use uh, some of the rules. Um, so let me write it out here. So it's B to the power of M times B to the minus two over B is equal to B to the 10. First thing I'm gonna do is put that B to the power of 10 over one. So I have a fraction equals to a fraction. Most simple way to solve a fraction is equal to a fraction is cross multiply. So multiplying uh, b to the m times b to the minus two times one stays as is. And then I have b times b to the 10. So on the left here, I have b to the m times b to the minus two is equal to, now what I could do here is actually I could put a one on top of that b, it's to the power of one. And using the top left hand log on page 21, a to the p times a to the q is equal to a to the p plus q. That's telling me then that my p is one and my q is 10. So adding them together, that's the same as b to the power of 11. Um, yeah, so b to the m times b to the minus two is equal to b to the 11. I have the same base here. So see the way they're all b, b, equals to b. So they're all the same. So therefore, really all I need to do here is compare the powers, b minus two and 11. Um, but we could go one step forward, actually, if you want. Going from this rule again, b to the m times b to the minus two, adding the powers, that's b to the m plus minus two. So I'm adding the powers together. One of them just happens to be a negative though, is equal to the b to the 11. So now actually I'm going to take my powers and let m plus minus two is equal to 11. Because remember the basis here, the large number is equal. B is equal to B. So therefore I'm going to go m um, plus minus two is equal to 11, which is m minus two is equal to 11. Move over to minus two or so add two to both sides gives me m is equal to 11 plus two which is giving me a value of m of 13. So question eight, it's quite text heavy, so I'll give you a minute yourself to read the information, but all the information in the paragraph there is also marked onto the diagram. So looking at uh, part A to this question, um, it's asking us to find the size of the angle C. Now there's a couple of different ways you can do this question. In order to find the angle C, I'm, I'm focusing in on this triangle here. So this yellow triangle is what I'm focusing in on. Um, if I sketch it out, um, and we'll examine it in a little bit more detail. So I'm trying to find C, I have a 90 degree, 220 high, 154 along the base, and I have an angle of 35 degrees. So there's a, there's a couple of different ways we could do it. Uh, just remember the easiest way is probably remembering that all angles in a triangle must add up to 180 degrees. So I'm simply just going to go 180 minus the 35 and the 90. So that's 180 minus 125, which is giving me angle C of 55 degrees. Now you could also use your uh, trigonometric ratios there like sine, cos and tan. So you could use tan there for instance, if you wished. Um, looking now at part B, Mary works out that the horizontal distance between the two buildings is 154 meters, correct to the nearest meter as shown. Uh, use Pythagoras theorem to work out the distance marked Y on the diagram. Uh, give your answer correct to the nearest meter. So I'll just sketch out the triangle. I'm using, I'm gonna actually use the same uh, triangle here. So I'm using the um, same one that I marked in yellow. I have a height of 220, 154 along the base. I have my angles that I already know. 
and I'm trying to find the size of y. Now it's telling me to use Pythagoras theorem here, so I can't use my sine, cos, or tan here. My Pythagoras theorem formula, c squared is equal to a squared plus b squared. The c is always the side across from the 90, so this is my c here, my y. And my a and my b are the other two sides, so it doesn't matter which one you call a and which one you call b, you just have to make sure you get the c correct. So it's 220 squared, um, plus 154 squared. So that's giving me y squared is equal to 220 by 220 is 48,400. So we're large numbers here. And then 154 by 154 is 23,716. Adding those two figures together, I'm getting 72,116. To get y in its own, I need to get the square root of 72,116, and the square root of that is, uh, on my calculator, it comes up as 22 root 149. I have to hit my SD button to get it as a decimal, which is 268.54. Question wants it to the nearest meter, so that's giving me 269 meters. And part C. Use trigonometry to work out the value of z, the height of building b. Now, I'm just going to scroll back up to the picture, actually, just so we can mark in some information here. So what they want us to find here is this height of the building, the height of block b, and they've called it z. Now, the triangle here that we're looking at, this one, isn't a right angle triangle. So I need to maybe break it up into two triangles. So what I'm going to do here is I'm first of all going to look at this triangle. And I'm going to get the height of this length here. Just part of the height of the building. And I might just call that Z1 for my on my answer now in a couple of minutes. Then I'm going to come to this triangle. And I'm going to get this length here. And then I'm just going to add those two lengths together. Because I'm breaking it up into two triangles um, to make right angle triangles. Because you can see here that these two angles are 90 degrees. So... Sketching out my first triangle, I have a length of 154 for the distance between the two buildings. I have my height along here, which is now going to be Z. I'll call it Z1, as I said. And then we know that the horizontal or the hypotenuse is 269. We found that um, up above in part B. So that's my first triangle. Now, we could use either our uh, Pythagoras theorem again, or we can use our um, trigonometric ratio. So for a change here, I'm going to use tan. So I would have tan as tan angle opposite over adjacent. Now, I know that this angle in here is 35 degrees from my picture, so this would be my opposite and my adjacent is what I'm trying to find down here. So filling that in, I have tan of 35 is equal to opposite 154, that's a 4 there, over um, Z1. Z is the height I want to find. I'm going to put that Z over 1 and cross multiply. So that's giving me Z1 times tan of 35 is equal to 154. So to get z on its own, I'm dividing across by my answer for tan of 35. So that's getting me part distance of about 220. Now, you should get the same using Pythagoras theorem. I think you get uh, 220.556 or something like that. Um, then I'm coming to my second shape. So let's draw it out again. So... Again, the distance between the two buildings is 154. I'm now trying to find Z2. And I know one of the angles, let's mark it in here, it's 20 degrees. And I need to find Z1. So once again, I'm going to use uh, tan because this would be my opposite and this would be my adjacent. So I'm now using tan of 20 is equal to Z2 over 154. Cross multiply again over one. That's giving me 154 uh, times tan of 20 is equal to Z2. And that's giving me 
uh, Z2 as 56.05. Now to get Z, I need to add my two answers together because I split this into two triangles, don't forget. So the total value of the height of building B is 220 plus my 56 is giving me 276 meters in height. Now, if you used your um, Pythagoras theorem for the first part of that question, remember we got 220.56. So that would have given you to the nearest meter as an answer of 277. So we're just gonna have to wait and see when the marking scheme comes out. Do they accept both 276 and 277? Um, but we'll wait and see. Question 9a, k is equal to 7 and m minus k is equal to 4. Work out the value of 9k minus 6m. So this is algebra and we're going to use our substitution. So we're going to sub in values for k and m. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to sub in my value for k, which is 7. But I don't know the value of m. But I do know the value of m minus k, which is equal to 4. So I'm just going to come over here and do a little bit of rough work here. So I know that uh, m minus k is equal to 4. But we know the value of k. So I'm going to go m minus 7. So I'm substituting in my value for k here. And I'm letting that equal to 4. I'm then going to add 7 to both sides or move over that 7. So that becomes 4 plus 7. So that's telling me that the value of m on its own is 11. So I'm going to take that 11 here and sub it in for m. So I'm going to draw my bracket, brackets meaning to multiply, and I'm subbing in my 11 for m. And then 9 sevens is 63, 6 elevens is 66, and 63 subtract 66 is negative 3. Uh, looking at part B to that question, I have 8ax minus 14bx plus 4ay minus 7by. So this is factorizing by group here. Um, so we'll do it both ways. So I'm just going to go through the first one. So we've factorized the first two, then factorize the second two. Looking at the first two, I can take out a 2 and an x. So I'm factorizing out 2x and 2x by 4a is 8ax and 2x by minus 7b is minus 14bx. In the next one, all I can factorize out is 1y, really. So 1y multiplied by 4a is um, 4ay, and y multiplied by minus 7b is minus 7by. I then put the 2x and the plus y, or the 1y together. You don't need to put in the 1. And then you can see that my second bracket is the same. It's 4a minus 7b. Now, you could have rearranged it. That's fine. You could have rearranged it to be 8ax um, plus 4ay minus 14bx uh, minus 7by. So that's the same. You can factorize it that way if you wish. But you should get the same answer. You will. Uh, part C. Write the following as a single fraction in its simplest form. So in order to subtract or add fractions, you need to get a common denominator. So my common denominator for this question is basically multiplying the two denominators by each other. So my common denominator here would be 2x plus 1 times 3x plus 5. Now you don't need to multiply out your two brackets, just leave it as that. I then come back to my two fractions. So let me write them out. So I have my first fraction subtract my second fraction. Now my original one was over 2x plus 1 and my second one was 3x plus 5 and on top of the first one I had a 2 and on top of the second one I had a 3. Now what am I doing to my common denominator? I'm now bringing in the 3x plus 5 on the first fraction so that means I need to multiply the top line by 3x plus 5 as well. So whatever I do to the bottom I have to do to the top. On the second fraction, I'm bringing in the 2x plus 1 on the bottom. That's my common denominator now. But I'm bringing that in on the top also. Again, whatever I do to the bottom, I have to do to the top to balance it out. So I now have two fractions uh, and I'm subtracting them. So to subtract them, I'm going to write them as a single fraction. So I'm going to multiply in this 2 first of all. So that will give me 6x plus 10. 
Then I'm coming to my second fraction. Don't forget though this minus, so it's minus three by two x, which is giving me minus six x. And it's minus three by positive one, which is giving me negative three. And that's all over my common denominator. I don't need to write it as two separate fractions anymore. And all I have to do now is just tidy up the top of the fraction. Six x minus six x is zero x. So they're canceling out with each other. And I just then have a plus 10 take away three, which is seven. So I have zero x plus seven or just seven over my common denominator, which is two x plus one, um, three x plus five. Looking now at part D, solve the equation. 2x squared uh, minus 7x minus 3 is equal to 0. Give your answer correct to two decimal points. So as soon as you see them asking you to give your answer to decimal places, that's kind of a little hint to tell you that you can't use the guide number, the two brackets here. You need to use your minus B formula from your log tables. So the minus B for solving quadratic equations is x minus or x is equal to minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2 times a. So that's the formula for my log tables. I'm going to write down the values now of my a, my b, and my c. The a is the number in front of the x squared, which is positive 2. The b is the number in front of the x, which is negative 7. Don't forget the negative there. And the c is the constant, the number on its own, which is also a negative, but negative 3. Filling in my formula, so I now have x is equal to minus b, so x is equal to minus minus 7, plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is minus 7 squared. Just put that into a bracket because your calculator needs to be in a bracket uh, when you're squaring it, otherwise it'll give you back the wrong sign. 4 times a, which is 4 times 2, um, times c, which is minus 3, and that's within the square root. And it's all over 2 multiplied by a, which is 2 times 2. So x is equal to those two negatives in front of the 7 will give me a plus. So it's positive 7 plus or minus the square root of minus 7 by minus 7, which is 49, minus 4 twos, which is 8, minus 8 by minus 3 is positive 24, all over 2 twos, which is 4. x now is equal to 7 plus or minus the square root of 73 all over 4. So my answers now are going to be x is equal to 7 uh, plus the square root of 73 all over 4 and x is equal to um, 7 minus. So this is where the plus and the minus comes into play. 73 over 4. Because the question said uh, solve the equation and when you have a quadratic equation you're always going to have two answers. So my answers here are x is equal to <coughs> 3.886 and x is equal to minus 0 0.386. Question set to two decimal places. So x is equal to 3.89 and x is equal to minus 0 0.39. So there are my solutions uh, to the equation. So looking now at question 10, I'll let you read it yourself there, but the part I'm going to jump to here is um, the scenario, for example. So here it's telling me that the point A shows that Ali, it took Ali one minute more than John to travel the first 10 kilometers. So the point A is here and you can see that it's, it's one up. So that's telling me that it's taken Ali one minute more than John. So if it's going up here, A here, is one minute longer than John. So that's the scenario they're giving me. So if I scroll down here to the first one, part A, it's saying, did Ali finish the kayak section ahead of John, behind John, or at the same time as John? Tick only one of the boxes. So the kayak here is this first section. Let me just highlight it. This is the kayak section. So we're looking at this region here. And did Ali finish the kayak ahead of John? So if we come up to this point here, so that there is telling me, if we come across to it, it's telling me that um, it took Ali more than John. So it took Ali two minutes more than John to finish the kayak, which is telling me then, so if it took her two minutes longer, it means that she finished behind John. Because think of you're running a race. If it took you two minutes longer than me to finish the race, well, then you are slower than me. So you finished behind me. 
Uh, looking now at part B to that question. Um, Ali had to stop briefly during the triathlon. John did not stop. State what distance Ali had traveled when he stopped and for how long he was stopped. So looking here at the graph, it looks like this section here is when he was stopped because you can see here at this point here, that would tell me that um, John is roughly two minutes or Ali is two minutes behind John. So if he stopped then from two to one, so it looks there like he stopped from about a minute and a half because you're going from two to that little part there, which is a half. So that's a minute and a half. So what distance had Ali traveled? Uh, it's 25 kilometers. So 25 for my kilometers. And the length of time Ali was stopped, well, it's from two to 0 0.5. So that's 1.5 minutes. So, um, yeah, 1.5 minutes. Part C, what was happening John and Ali at the point marked B on the diagram? So this is part B here. And what does that point B tell us? Well, that tells us that neither John or Ali were ahead of each other. So I'm just gonna say some scenarios there. You could say that they were both level. Maybe they were side by side. They completed it at the same time or they met each other. So that line B, where it meets at line at point B, uh, they are equal to each other. In other words, neither Ali was ahead or John. So there's just three um, possible solutions or possible answers for part C. Part D, the table below shows the time it took John to complete each of the three sections in the triathlon, as well as the total time for the triathlon. Use the diagram, fill in the four missing times for Ali. So it's telling us here that John completes the kayak in 32 minutes. So John completes it in 32 minutes. You can see here on the kayak, that it took Ali two minutes more than John to complete the kayak. So if it took John 32 minutes, then it takes Ali 34 minutes to complete the triathlon or to complete the kayak. So I'm gonna insert 34 in here. So I got that by going 32 minutes plus two minutes. Looking now at the cycle, John completed the cycle in 38 minutes. So looking at our table, the end of the cycle is here. And at that point, it's telling us that it took uh, Ali one minute less than John. So if it took John 38, well, then it took Ali 37. So I'm taking one away from 38. So in here, 37, 38 subtract one. Looking now at the run. The question tells us that John completes the run in 36 minutes. Once again, here you can see that Ali it took Ali one minute less than John. So if I bring it across here, so I'm gonna subtract one from John's 36 minutes. So filling that in, I get 35. So this is found by subtracting one away from 36. And the total time, 34 plus 37 plus 35 is giving me 106 minutes. So they completed the triathlon actually in the same time. Looking now at the final part to this question, John and Ali also ran a 400 meter race. John's average speed for the 400 meters was 7.8 meters per second. It took Ali two seconds more than John to run the 400 meter race. Work out Ali's average speed for the 400 meter race. Okay, so a little bit of work in this one. So let's look at John here for a second. So John has an average speed of 7.8 meters per second. Now, if we look at our distance, speed, and time triangle here, distance, speed, and time, I'm trying to find the time here. How long did it take John to complete the race? Because it's telling us here in the question that it took Ali two seconds more. So it's focusing in on time here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do time, and time is found by dividing distance by speed. Now I have all that information from the question here because the distance of the race was 400 meters and John's speed was 7.8 meters per second. So working that out on my calculator, 
I'm finding out that John completes the race in 51.28 seconds. So that's John. Now, the question then tells us that Ali takes two seconds more than John. So I'm now coming over here and I'm looking at Ali completing the race. And let's look at her time. So Ali's time is two seconds more than John. John took 51.28 seconds. Adding on two seconds to this gives me Ali's time of 53.28 seconds. So that's Ali's time. Now the question wants us to find Ali's average speed. And coming back to my distance speed and triangle, distance speed and time triangle here, speed is given by distance over time. Again, we know the distance of the race, it's 400 meters. The time it took her, 53.28 seconds. Dividing that on my calculator is giving me a speed of seven and a half meters per second. So Ali's average speed is 7.5 meters per second. Question 11. The line H has a slope of four and passes through the point 2012. So you can see it here in the diagram. Find the coordinates of any other point on that red line. In other words, on the line H, other than the point 2012. Show your workings out down in the box here below, I presume, and write your answer in here. So there's two ways I'm gonna go through it. So the first way I'm gonna go through it is using rise over run. The second method, I'll use my equation of the line. So up to you which way you want to do it. As I said, the first one is I'm gonna use rise over run. So if I look at my diagram here for a second, I'm just gonna zoom in on it. And rise over run would look something like this. So I'm just gonna pick a random point on this line H. So there's my rise and there's my run. Now remember the formula here, what does rise over run find me? Rise over run finds me slope. And we know that the slope of this line is four. So rise over run is equal to four. So in other words, if I put in rise of four and run of one, that will give me uh, a slope of four. So in other words, I could use a rise of four here and a run of one to get me um, this new point here. So what does that mean? If I wanna find that point, this new point here in my graph, I would have to come over one unit on my x so that would be over to 21 on the x and i need to go up four units on my y axis don't forget this is my y axis so in other words i'm going up four from the 12 because the 12 is the y coordinate so if i go up four from 12 that would bring me to 16. so one possible value for a point on that line could be 21 16. Now, that way is a little bit abstract. It mightn't be the nicest way to do that question. You might prefer just to use um, y, or sorry, what, the y minus y1 equals mx minus x1, the equation of the line formula from the log tables. So we'll go with that method here now. So y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. But again, nothing wrong with what I just did up above. So what do we know here? We know that the slope is four, so I'm subbing in m as four, and the point that I'm using here, again, I'm not using the 2116, I'm using the original point, the 2012. So imagine I didn't know the 2116. And on this point, I'd have x1, y1. So filling in my y minus 12 is equal to m, which is four, times x minus 20. So that's my equation of the line. I'm just gonna work it out a little bit now. So that's giving me y minus 12 is equal to 4x minus 80. And tidying it all up a little bit would give me 4x minus y minus 80 plus 12 is equal to zero. So an equation of the line here is doo -doo 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 -doo, like that. 4x minus y minus 68 is equal to zero. Now, what was the point of that? Let's come back up to the picture here and I'll show you. So when you have the equation of the line, you can always find out where a line cuts an axis. So an axis here being the x-axis. So that point where that line cuts the x-axis, I know that the y has to be zero there, don't I? Because I'm coming across some value. So this value could be something like, I don't know, seven. 
but I'd be going up or down zero. So it'd be seven, zero. Well, I don't know if it's seven, but that's what I need to find out. But it's definitely something zero. So in other words, I'm going to let uh, y is equal to zero to find out where it cuts the x axis. So all I just need to do now is come to my equation of the line that I found and sub in zero for y, which will give me four x minus 68 is equal to zero add 68 to both sides or move it over so that's giving me a value for x of um, 17. so another value there for my my point would be 17 0. there is a second possible value now what i also could have done is i could have let uh, x is equal to zero because don't forget this red line here technically continues 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 on down and it'll eventually cut the y-axis and where it cuts the y-axis I know that the x has to be zero here I don't know what the y value is but that's what I'm trying to find out now so by letting x is equal to zero I'd be going four times zero I'd be summing zero in for x into my equation of the line which would give me minus y minus 68 is equal to zero so minus y is equal to positive 68 so positive y is equal to negative 68 so a third point there would be 0 minus 68. So there are just three ways of um, finding a point in that line. Any one of the three will do. Question 12. The diagram below shows the circle K not to scale. The points A, B and C lie on the circle. A and B is the diameter of the circle and AC is equal to 8. The area of the circle K is equal to 25 pi. Work out the size of the smallest angle in the triangle. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to use the area of the circle, uh, first of all, to figure out the radius of the circle. Because by finding the radius of the circle, the radius of the circle goes from the center out to A or B. So that'll give me the length of that line there because it's the diameter of the circle because it goes through the center. So let's work with that first. So from my log tables, the area of a circle is given by pi r squared. Now the area of this circle is 25 pi. So I'm going to go 25 pi is equal to pi r squared. I can divide both sides by the pi or cancel them out. So I'm left with 25 is equal to r squared. To get r on its own, I'm getting the square root of 25 and the square root of 25 is five. So the radius of this circle is five, which means that the diameter of that circle is two times five, which is 10. And the diameter of that circle is basically this length here, which is now giving me a length of 10 centimeters. Now I have this other side here, which is eight, um, but the side CB, if we focus in on that for a second. Now the question here has highlighted the fact that it has to be the smallest angle. Now we can probably notice by looking at the picture that this angle here is the smallest, but I'm just gonna spend a little bit of time showing why that's the smallest, because remember that the side opposite the shortest length or the angle opposite the shortest length is always the smallest angle. So I'm going to find the length of this side CB to prove that it's smaller than eight and 10. Now, maybe I'm overdoing it here. I'm not sure, but I'm going to do it nonetheless because I can. So another little fact we know about this triangle here is that the triangle that's inside the circle goes through the diameter and touches the edge of the circle at C. So that means that this angle here at C is a 90 degree angle. So that's something that I know. Now, if I look at that triangle, I'm going to use Pythagoras theorem to find this side. Uh, I'll call it, uh, no, let's actually not call it X. Let's just call it CB, what it should be called. So it's CB. So using Pythagoras theorem, C squared is equal to A squared plus B squared. C is always the side across from the 90. So that's the 10. So I have 10 squared is equal to a squared plus b squared. The a and the b doesn't matter which one you want to call them. So I'm going to go like this. So that's giving me 100 is equal to 64 plus c b squared. I'm going to subtract the 64. So that's 100 subtract 64 is equal to c b to be squared, which is giving me 36 is equal to c b squared. And then to get CB on its own, I get the square root of 36, 
which is six centimeters. So I've just proved the length of CB is six centimeters. And that means, yes, the, uh, the angle across from the shortest length is the smallest angle. So I've just proved that fact. I know we can probably see it from the picture, but as I said, when we come back up to the question, there's a couple of things that are maybe hinting I should have done that because it said the picture is not to scale and it's telling me to find the smallest angle. So I have enough information there now to use one of my trigonometric ratios to find the size of that angle. So if I draw out my triangle, um, if I maybe rotate it a little bit, so let's see how it would look. So if I maybe put the 90 degree down here, I would have my angle C here. Um, I'm going to come across um, 8 to my A, and I'm going to go up maybe uh, 10 from A to B. So I'll put my B up here, so that would be 10, and the distance from C to B then is 6. So I've just flipped my triangle. Just remember though, which angle are we trying to find? It's this one A, so I'm trying to find the size of this angle. So we have enough information there now to use any one of our three trigonometric ratios. Silly old Harry caught a herring trawling off America. We can use any one of the three. I'm going to use cos. So how would that look? So I'd have cos angle. So cos A is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. Let me just scroll down here and make a bit of room for myself. So I have cos of angle which is adjacent, which is going to be, well, let's label these up. So this would be my hypotenuse opposite the angle, and then my adjacent would be eight. So my adjacent here is eight and hypotenuse of 10. To get A on its own, I need to bring over the cos. So that becomes cos with a little minus one. So cos inverse of eight over 10. So that gives me an angle size of 36.87 degrees. Question wants it, uh, no, it doesn't say to um, nearest number or to decimal. So 36.87 is fine, or if you prefer, 37 degrees.